Hi, this is Dr. Wooler for Integrated Medicine Academy. This is the monthly installment for Great Plains Laboratories webinars. And tonight we're gonna we're gonna talk about some common medical issues seen in autism. If you've listened to my presentations before, you'll probably recognize some of these topics. So it's not a talk that is heavy duty into treatment. It's just to give you an overview, particularly if you're a new parent or maybe a new practitioner who's trying to understand a little bit more about this biomedical approach, this integrative medicine approach to autism. What are some things that you're going to see? Which, what are some things you're going to encounter? Or if you're a parent or a caregiver, what are some things that you should be aware of to start recognizing as you move forward with this approach for your child? There's a lot of other lectures on the webinar library from Great Plains that I've done and others that go into different aspects of what I'll be talking about tonight. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through briefly in these different categories. We're going to talk about digestive disorders, microbiome imbalances, which has to do with the gut flora food sensitivity problems, mitochondrial and methylation issues, cholesterol, vitamin D, lithium, and heavy metal toxicity as we, as we wrap things up. If you do post questions, those questions will be sent to me. What happens is, is the, uh, uh, the organizer for the webinar will gather in the uh, email questions, send them to me, and then I'll respond by email. I'll also give you a website at the end here that is a place where you can post questions to me directly as well. And one of the things that I've noticed for years, when it comes to medical issues with children on the autism spectrum, is that the vast majority of them are ignored. If you take a child who does not have a diagnosis of autism, and they have, let's say, some physical milestone issues, or they've got chronic diarrhea problems, maybe some chronic illness, whether that's a lot of ear infections or respiratory problems, eczema, digestive issues, and throw into the mix some anxiety, maybe some attention problems. Typically what's going to happen with that child is they're going to get some laboratory work done. They're going to get a stool test done, perhaps look to see if they have an infection, blood work to see if there's some type of an immune problem. There's going to be some investigation that goes on. The problem is, is if you take that same child and you put a label of autism on them, for the most part, and this doesn't always happen, this isn't a blanket statement that all conventional doctors do this, but many do and much of the traditional medical community will ignore these underlying physical issues. And I I call it being prejudiced by the diagnosis. It's as if doctors sort of forget about how to do an evaluation because they get prejudiced by this, this label of autism, thinking that all of these factors are somehow linked to their autism, and they're not. And the reality is, is that there are a lot of what are called comorbid conditions in autism, and many of these are actually recognized by the centers of disease control. And they tend to give a fairly short list. So in the autism population, there is a higher prevalence of ear and respiratory issues, atopic dermatitis, asthma, allergic rhinitis, sleep problems we know are a major issue. Headaches, migraine headaches can also be seen. Admittingly, that's a difficult thing sometimes to figure out because most kids don't have language where they can tell you that they're having headaches. We know that seizure disorders are quite high, 35-40%, a lot of gastrointestinal problems, and then you know early, uh, early mortality is also higher in this population as well. And so these comorbid conditions are what essentially we're treating as biomedical doctors, but in treating those comorbid issues, many times the core issues of kids, their language problems, their social issues, their behavioral issues, often improve or in some cases go away. So 
when we talk about treating autism, really what we're treating is we're looking at the underlying medical problems that are common to these kids, applying therapeutics to those, whether it's medications or supplements or dietary interventions, and then watching to see what happens as far as the core autistic characteristics. And many kids improve. And we know that this, even this list from the Centers for Disease Control is a short one. I mean, this is just a partial list. Let's go through and talk a little bit about some of the digestive issues. And it's been well known for a long time that digestive problems have a very high prevalence rate in the autism community versus kids of the same age and sex who are not autistic. And this was just one example of a paper that came out in 2006 that looked at 50 children in each group, kids that had certain developmental disorders that were not autistic, those that were developmentally normal, normal and those that were autistic. And what they found is that 7% of the children with autism had GI issues, and that would be bloating, gas, diarrhea, constipation. Compared to 42% of the kids that had some developmental disorder but they weren't autistic versus 28% of the typical children or neurotypical kids. And Dr. Bowie, who's actually a famous gastroenterologist, pediatric gastroenterologist, who's done a lot of papers and studies on his own, has you know commented that look, we we know the GI system can be a contributing factor to many of the behavioral problems, abdominal pain, discomfort, etc. It makes no sense to just give psychotropic medications when we might have a child who has underlying gut problems that may be either causing or contributing to the behavioral issues. But unfortunately, again, the kids get overlooked because of their diagnosis. And so what are some of the digestive issues that come up on the comorbid problem list? Well, gastritis, which would be inflammation in the stomach, esophageal reflux disease. We certainly can see that in infants. Well, it happens in some of these kids as well. Irritable bowel colitis, constipation is a big one. The motility-based disorders, a um, <clears throat> little bit difficult, more difficult to figure out at times because it seems to be some type of intrinsic neurological issue where you're not getting um, good neurotransmitter control into the digestive system where the enteric nervous system is functioning properly, which by the way, motility-based disorders can be a triggering factor for overgrowth syndromes, even the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, which is now sort of, um, sort of quite popular in medicine today or particularly integrative medicine for many people who have been suffering with irritable bowel for quite some time. And we know that food allergy and sensitivity are big problems as well. Bowel inflammation is a real problem for many of these kids. Not all of them have the severe bowel inflammation or what's called the autistic enterocolitis problems that, um, that we commonly hear about particularly with those kids who've regressed, let's say, for example, after the MMR vaccine. But there are certainly a number of kids who just continue to have chronic bowel issues, who don't ever really progress, despite the best efforts of the parents, treating yeast or bacterial issues, their bowel, bowel problems never really seem to resolve. These are the kids that typically, once they're scoped, it's quite common that they show up to have pretty severe bowel inflammation. And the bowel inflammation patterns of many of these kids looks like Crohn's disease, which is an autoimmune disorder attacking the small bowel. Um, you also get some, it, with some of these kids as well, large intestine um, effects as well. It turns out that the ileum, the last part of the small intestine is the place that's most vulnerable to a lot of this immunological reactivity. And some of the behavioral symptoms or signs that can come up with self-injurious behavior, food avoidance, poor sleep, poor growth and absorption can actually come about because if the small bowel is inflamed or the ileum is inflamed, it is 
an indicator of poor overall digestion. From a laboratory standpoint, one of the things that I'll commonly do is a comprehensive digestive stool analysis to evaluate four markers of inflammation. Lactoferrin and calprotectin are indicators of bowel inflammation more from an inflammatory bowel disease standpoint versus an irritable bowel standpoint. Lysozyme is a marker that oftentimes will show up when irritable bowel is occurring, and that could happen sometimes from because of bacterial overgrowth, food, you know, food sensitivity. Generally, and I want to, I don't, I don't want to give a black or white here, but generally, lysozyme would be less of a an issue, for example, than say calprotectin or lactoferrin. So the comprehensive stool test can help identify that. The problem is to really be able to fully analyze what is happening in the digestive system of many of these kids who have ongoing bowel problems. That's where you need to look at doing intestinal scoping. Some of them need endoscopy where they look down the throat into the stomach and the upper part of the small intestine. Some need where a colonoscopy where they look up the back end, look at the large intestine. And then there's the pill cam technique which is often used to assess the entire bowel, particularly the, the lower sections of the small intestine, to look for areas of inflammation and lesions that normally can't be seen by camera view. Now, again, it's not something that is commonly done or is readily available for a lot of people. So we're left with sort of backtracking on symptoms, lack of improvement despite your best efforts, of biomedical intervention, of diet supplements, treating gut problems, yeast and bacteria, and then also the symptom picture of a child. One of the classic things that many kids do who have a lot of digestive pain and discomfort is they leverage themselves over furniture. This is an image here from a photo Dr. Krigsman has in one of his presentations of a child leaning against the end of a bench or a table. Most small children don't have that upper body strength to really be able to leverage against their abdomen to decrease discomfort. And so they have to do it with some type of furniture object. Now, if this happens periodically, a child running back and forth and they're kind of throwing themselves over the, the edge of a table or something, that's one thing. But this is a deliberate act to try to relieve pressure. We know that abdominal bloating is quite common with kids. And it can come about from a number of issues. Gas production, trapped gas in the bowel, whether it's because of bacterial or yeast overgrowth or stool, you know, severe constipation, can all lead to abdominal bloating. Certainly poor digestive enzyme production can also lead to abdominal bloating. One of the things about a distended abdomen is what I have found is it's commonly, or I should say most commonly associated with constipation. In some kids, getting an, uh, an abdominal x-ray to identify actually how much stool is in the bowel can be worthwhile. Years ago, I had a child come into my practice. He's five years old at the time, you know, two and a half at the age of diagnosis. Typical things, expressive language problems, social withdrawal, sound sensitivity, didn't have the aggressive or self-injurious behavior had that typical pregnant belly appearance on physical examination and this repetitive behavior where he would lie on the floor and rub back and forth on his abdomen. Now he was purposely doing it on his abdomen versus his groin area. Parents reported that he had in quotes a normal bowel movement every day but a lot of foul-smelling stool, okay? So an abdominal x-ray was done, and what they found was that there was a lot of gas trapped in the colon and a lot of fecal residue also in the large intestine that was essentially obscuring imaging of the abdomen and pelvic areas. This kid was full of poop. And despite the fact that he was having, a, in quote, a normal bowel movement, he was still constipated because the, the amount of backed up stool that was occurring in his, in his colon, he essentially was pinching off a small section of that every day that made him look like he was emptying his bowels, 
all he was really doing was just cutting off a piece of much larger stool that was just constantly building up. So constipation is a big problem. Now some of it can come about because of just mm, difficulties in passing stool. Okay, that urge to go but cannot pass stool effect. That's the, really the more common or the most common issue that I see with regards to constipation. Sometimes it can is because of lack of fiber, maybe some poor tone or some dehydration effect, but it's usually the more common scenario. So the child has the urge to go, just can't get it out. Then there's the urge to go but withholds the stool. This is almost always a behavioral issue, and a lot of times it's related to fear and anxiety. Perhaps that child had uh, a negative experience in the past where they had a really painful bowel movement, and so they override their body's natural tendency to move their bowels, and they hold it back. So that often requires some type of behavioral therapy intervention. And then there's the no, no sensation to go. And that gets a little more complicated because you've got a child who has the ability to go, they just can't sense that they have to go. This particular scenario, by the way, is often improved by going off of gluten and casein. Not always, but it often is the case. And I'll explain that in a second as we get to the food section. Well, microbiome imbalances, what do we mean by this? Well, one of the things we know about the digestive system, particularly the large intestine, is where the bulk of the natural flora exist in our digestive system is in the large bowel. We actually have a very small percentage of all of the intestinal bacteria that reside in the small intestine. And the microbiome makes up this, this microenvironment that has a tremendous profound effect on our overall health. And when that microbiome becomes altered, whether it's because of some other opportunistic bacteria, a parasitic infection, antibiotic you know, use, or some other factor that is depleting the normal flora, we create an avenue for disharmony. This was just an example of a comprehensive digestive stool analysis that had no growth of bifidobacter, E. coli, lactobacillus, and enterococcus. And we know that the normal bacteria in the digestive system are not only there to help just protect against some of the bad bacteria, but they also increase bioconversion of different nutrients. They help to reduce inflammation. They help to increase the functionality of what's called the first line of immune defense, which is the immune system that lines the digestive system. They create that protective barrier. What's interesting also about probiotics is that they also, or these probiotics, you should say these, these normal bacteria, they also create their own biofilm. So that biofilm is not just part of some of the opportunistic bacteria and yeast, but it's also part of the good bacteria too. And they create harmony that not only has an effect in the gut, but it also has a regulatory effect in the brain. And this is the gut-brain axis phenomena that's being now researched more and more. Because when the scales are tipped towards dysbiosis, where we get an overgrowth of opportunistic bacteria and candida, there is chemical influences that occur that have negative consequences on the brain that can affect behavior, can affect cog uh, cognitive abilities, attention and focusing and sleep, etc. This is just an image here talking about how normal bacteria have a regulating effect on those tight junctions that keep the lining of the gut intact have a regulating effect over the pro-inflammatory chemicals that can get produced that not only have local effect in the gut but can have negative consequences systemically in the peripheral nervous system and central nervous system. And again, 
these normal probiotics can also have a beneficial effect in improving the functionality of biofilm as a protective barrier as well. And one of the things that all of these flora do is help prevent against the overgrowth of candida. And the whole thing is about candida is many of these kids have candida problems. Not all of them are as compromised by the presence of candida as the others. Some are extremely sensitive to the toxins of candida. Some seem to be more susceptible to deep-seated or invasiveness of candida. Um, some have high amounts of candida that might show up, but they're not overly compromised by it behaviorally. What I mean by that behaviorally is we often find that many of the kids on autism, when they have high candida levels who are neurologically sensitive to the candida, have a lot of behavioral issues, goofiness, giddiness, silliness, inappropriate laughter, sleep problems, attention issues. But they don't all have that, um, but a certain select do. The other thing about candida is it's really impractical to think that you're going to get rid of all of it. And so people spend an enormous amount of time trying to kill off candida to where every last part of it's gone, and it's just not practical because candida is really a, a normal part of our environment, just like many of these bacteria are. But we can at least control it to some degree and increase the overall functionality of the body by improving nutrient levels, decreasing inflammation, um, working on improving diet, etc. The other thing about candida from a medical standpoint is it's a very tenacious, very smart and sophisticated organism. And much of its ability to become invasive, it can control itself. Here was an image that comes, uh, that shows us here a yeast cell, this unicellular yeast cell that's at what's called a low fungal load. And for the most part, it's being antagonized or at least controlled somewhat by normal bacterial flora. But something creates a shift, whether it's an antibiotic, for example, some type of life stressor, or maybe just something that's happening at the local level where the candida colonies exist because they can themselves manipulate the environment. So candida can manipulate the pH, the acid alkaline base in its environment, uh, temperature changes, um, food supply changes can all trigger a stressful event on a yeast cell to move from what's called a unicellular state to an invasive state. Candida produces a number of proteins, something called adhesin, which allows that candida to adhere itself to certain tissue surfaces. The invasin protein is what allows that candida to grow this hypha, this tentacle that pierces through an epithelial cell or pierces through or between two attached epithelial cells, essentially obliterating that tight junction. And so chronic candida can be a cause of leaky gut. And once the candida engages the immune system past this epithelial layer is where it starts to trigger inflammation and starts to engage the immune system as a whole. Much more sophisticated, much more adaptive in many respects than most bacteria. We know that candida can give off a number of different toxins. One of its preferred fuel sources is glucose. Well, one of the byproducts of glucose metabolism is ethanol or alcohol. And so this is where some of the alcohol-related symptoms can appear in certain individuals. And these are real and defined problems. And then we get into the more severe aspects of candida overgrowth that most conventional docs wouldn't even think about um, or even know about in, unless they've worked in this field for quite some time. Fecal smearing is a phenomena that I have seen associated with severe candida overgrowth. Now, it's an extreme problem. 
it causes a tremendous amount of family stress and a tremendous amount of disruption in the household and certainly is a very dysfunctional behavioral problem. I don't want to say all cases, I've seen some cases, many in most most cases I would say, linked to some type of problem with candida. When I used to practice in Southern California, Southern California is very prone, I worked in San Diego, San Diego County is very prone to wildfires. In fact, there's a massive wildfire burning now in one of the communities in Southern California. And it's a time when the winds generally get hot blowing from the desert and blow westwards towards the Pacific Ocean. And in doing so, they bring in a lot of debris and they, people's allergy levels tend to go up you know, pretty significantly. And a lot of times I would see an uptick in yeast behavior associated with an increase in environmental allergies associated around these certain times of the year where we'd get these desert winds that would blow in from east to west towards the Pacific Ocean. In one particular case, there was a family that I had that lived downwind from towards the ocean area of San Diego um, when there was a massive wildfire that was occurring. And this wildfire was huge. It actually blew from the mountains came ripping down through a part of San Diego County out towards the Pacific Ocean and was throwing embers about a mile ahead that were catching new communities on fire. Anyway, this family was downwind from all of the smoke and they had a child who's fairly, you know, severely autistic, but overall well controlled with the diet and supplements and antifungal therapy they were doing. And very shortly after these environmental pollutants you know, occurred, he started to regress quite significantly, becoming hyperactive, tremendous erratic behavior, and started smearing feces on his bedroom and bathroom walls. Well, <clears throat> I had some history with the child, and I knew that this was most likely a severe candida overgrowth. So I put him on some Diflucan. Excuse me a second. I don't remember the exact dose, it might have been like 100 milligrams or 200 milligrams a day, but I put him on the Diflucan for a couple weeks because I realized that if I tried to give him a botanical or use a little Nystatin, it wasn't likely going to work or it wasn't going to have an immediate effect. And this was, we needed something immediate to happen, like within a couple days. And it worked. As a matter of fact, his fecal smearing and erratic behavior normalized about 72 hours into the Diflucan use. Now, it wasn't a cure-all, but it was an indicator that severe environmental pol uh, pollution, allergies specifically, in this particular case because of all the smoke, was a trigger in his body for um, an exacerbation of the underlying candida problem. But it also is a good, a good indicator to me about how powerful a candida problem can be and how profound it can, what kind of profound effects it can have on the individual's health, personality, and behavioral issues. Now, I just talked about Diflucan, but one of the remedies that I've started using more and more commonly now over the past couple of years, and I actually use Biocidin too with some of the treatments for Clostridia. I really like this product. There are other nice you know, products on the market, but Biocidin comes from Biobotanical Research is an excellent product. And one of the reasons I like it is it's, it's concentrated and it's very potent botanical, but it's also easy for kids to take. So many of the botanicals that are used just don't have a real pleasant taste. And I'll have a lot of kids that will actually take Biocidin directly in the mouth. You can also mix it in water and dilute juice. And biocidin has actually been shown to be effective against things like candida and clostridia too, and also other types of bacteria and even molds. And one of the interesting things about biocidin is it seems to also be effective against the biofilm forms of so many of the different types of pathogens that we test for or we can see show up on the testing from candida to you know, Klebsiella, to staph. I've seen it even treat 
certain parasites like Blastocystis hominis. And if you look up any of my lectures on Clostridia bacteria, there are some protocols that I've used that have been very helpful for Clostridia bacterial problems. And if you have any questions more specifically about that too, you can always post me through the online website that I have, and I'll show you that slide too here short towards the end of this presentation at autismactionplan.com. We know that Clostridia bacteria is a major medical issue for kids on the spectrum. Well, we're not specifically talking about the Clostridia difficile forms that are producing the toxins A and B that trigger the Clostridia-induced diarrhea or the inflammatory bowel disease. What we're talking about more predominantly is the type of Clostridia that are producing the various toxins that affect the neurochemicals in the brain and nervous system. And if you've seen my presentations before, you've probably seen this slide before as well, or even Dr. Shaw. Clostridia are notorious for producing different types of compounds that can affect neurochemistry. One in particular is called 4-creosol. The other is called HPHPA. Both of these can be analyzed off of the organic acids test from Great Plains Lab. Both have a blocking effect on dopamine beta hydroxylase. And dopamine beta hydroxylase is the enzyme that converts dopamine to norepinephrine. And when dopamine beta hydroxylase is inhibited, you tend to get an increase in dopamine. And too much dopamine can be neurotoxic. It can cause antioxidant stress, glutathione deficiency, and what's called apoptosis of brain cells, which means premature death of brain cells in the presence of too much dopamine. Behaviorally, we'll see aggressive behavior, self-injurious behavior, irritability, agitation, and in extreme cases, even psychosis, and even more extreme cases, there have been issues linked to schizophrenia. So it's critical that if you have a child, if you're a doctor who's working with a child who has a lot of behavioral issues, particularly irritability, agitation, aggression, etc., that you learn how to do the organic acid test to analyze for the presence of these two toxins. <clears throat> okay, food sensitivities. Now, we know that a lot of kids do very well in a gluten casein-free diet. And there's been a lot of research, this is just one example here, that shows that food sensitivities are, have a much higher prevalence in this population than in neurotypical individuals. Certainly with regards to cow dairy, from an immune system standpoint, as well as what are called peptides. Now this was a paper that came out in 2000 out of the University of Florida where they were looking at what, what were called peptides. These are little small amino acid chains or fragments of proteins that can have a drug-like effect in kids with autism, and they also found it very high in individuals with schizophrenia. Now, they also found in the same populations very high levels of IgG antibodies indicating immune sensitivity to wheat and dairy as well. And one of the things that was interesting, even going back to 2000, they found that a gluten casein-free diet caused significant improvement in about 80% of the autistic patients within a three-month period of time. Now, the story really begins with regards to peptides with casein. It really has to do with the, the shifting of casein that occurred or you know, occurred over a period of time in Europe where European dairy cows started to mutate their casein towards <clears throat> what was called an A1 form of beta casein. And essentially what happened is is that proline and the, the amino acid proline, which is sit, sitting at the 67th position on this peptide chain, was switched out for histidine. And that makes all the difference in the world as far as how these things act chemically in the body. And so this configuration has this morphine opiate effect in the nervous system. 
It can be tested for by doing a urinary peptide test from Great Plains Lab. This is a simple urine test that can look at the elevation of these peptides. You'll notice in this particular sample here, casomorphine greater than 500, the test maxes out at 500, is, and the glutamorphine is also high as well. What's happening is, is that these, these opiates, these peptides, are reacting with what are called mu opo opioid receptors in the brain and nervous system. You've probably seen the commercials now online, I can't remember the name of the drug, but they're mu opioid blockers is what they are. Because what they're trying to do is prevent against the opioid-induced constipation. I mean, how many kids have constipation problems with autism? I mean, the, the level is huge. Sometimes it's improved with going on a gluten casein free diet. Not always, but, but at times it is. Also, these opioids, opiates, have an analgesic effect. And this is where these kids have problems from a sensory standpoint. They don't react to pain in a normal way. These opiates, or these peptides, I should say, have a drug-like effect. And so some of the kids can have an addictive nature to those foods. Addictive nature to where they only want to eat gluten and casein foods, for example. So this is an area that has been well-researched, well-recognized, unfortunately still denied by some within the medical community, but it's true, it works. The, the chemistry is there. The, the diet works, and it's probably from, a, from a, an introductory standpoint of anything biomedical, a gluten casein free diet still, for many kids, plays a significant role in their overall biomedical approach. Other aspects of things that often get ignored or not even recognized are things like oxalate metabolism problems. Oxalates are these organic compounds that um, can have a very acidic effect in the body. In fact, oxalic acid is the most acidic of all organic acids. Most of the time our oxalate can, uh, you know, uh, accumulation is from dietary intervention, or excuse me, dietary consumption of high oxalate foods. But we can also have a candida component where candida is also producing oxalates. Because what happens is, is candida produces enzymes that break down collagen and collagen feeds into these oxalate pathways. Now, some of the things that can be observed in individuals with oxalate issues, bladder irritability, fibromyalgia-like discomfort, moodiness, irritability, aggressive behavior in some kids, trigger point tenderness, muscle pain and tenderness, these have all been associated with it. With some of the kids on the spectrum, because they don't have the language, it can be difficult to know how bothered are they by high oxalate problems. And again, this is where something like the organic acid test comes into play because it helps to at least evaluate the level and then based on observation and clinical history, you can get a little bit more insight into how big of a problem this really is. If you think about it from a medical standpoint, <clears throat> many of the kids on the autism spectrum who have high oxalates tend to have very high levels. In fact, the one study that Great Plains has talked about, whether you looked at 116 children, 100 were autistic, uh, 16 were neurotypical, about a third of oxalate, which was considered, uh, which was consistent with what's called a genetic hyperoxaluria condition, meaning that there's some type of genetic problem that's leading to the, to the accumulation of oxalates. So above 90 is an indicator of a genetic hyperoxaluria. That doesn't mean that it exists, it's just indicating that that's kind of the cutoff that's used from a conventional standpoint. What they also found is that the higher the level of arabinose from candida, 
generally the higher the level of oxalate. Now that doesn't always coincide, but it's important to remember that candida can be a contributing fa factor to oxalates as well. So oxalate issues are an important underlying and fairly common medical issue seen in autism. And because of the complexities of oxal uh, oxalates, they can often contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction. Now the mitochondria are these small energy factories in our cells and they are usually fairly robust but in, in some individuals there's many things that can compromise their function. And in severe cases of mitochondrial diseases, heart defects, severe gastrointestinal problems, brain abnormalities, coordination problems can come about. What's more common is what's called mitochondrial dysfunction, where the mitochondria don't have an inherent disease process, but other external factors are impacting upon the mitochondria's ability to function normally, which can then lead to things like attention and language and immune problems and gut problems, etc. And in fact, really, the the areas of the body that are generally under high demand, okay, the central nervous system, the peripheral nervous system, the GI, the immune system, the muscle, skeletal system are high demand areas in the body. And so therefore the mitochondria that support those systems are under high demand to keep up. And so they're vulnerable for things to damage them or for things to go wrong. And that's essentially what this paper is talking about is that my, you know, abnormalities in mitochondrial function are fairly common in autism and can affect these different types of organ systems. And one of the things that shows up is that kids with mito issues oftentimes um, show up quite, quite even quite more significantly than children with autism who don't have mitochondrial problems uh, and certainly compared to the general population where you know GI issues are not all that significant. So this sort of leads us back to this discussion about the gut you know and the fact that the digestive system really is an area that is oftentimes very compromised with kids on the spectrum and so therefore from a testing standpoint that's something why the organic acid test is so important and then as a follow-up or an add-on to is the comprehensive digestive stool tests. Now there are a lot of things that have been looked at and recognized clinically and scientifically that can compromise mitochondrial function. There's not usually one thing, it's a, it's a multitude of things. Environmental chemicals, heavy metals, poor biochemical balance in the body, nutritional deficiencies, and then some of the toxins that come from the gut. In fact, one of the, the toxins that gets produced by Clostridia bacteria is called propionic acid. And propionic acid has a direct effect at causing dysfunction in the mitochondria. So one of the things that I always look at when I'm looking at an organic acid test in a child who has you know, poor muscle tone or poor energy or poor immune function or behavioral issues, etc is to say first off do they have any kind of mitochondrial issues going on and then secondly do they have anything that could be contributing to it candida problems oxalate issues clostridia problems are very high on the list and so are methylation problems i mean the methylation discussion has been around for years in fact if I think back to some of the early conferences I went to from the Defeat Autism Now um, organization going all the way back to the early 2000s, they were talking about methylation problems back then. In fact, one of the, the, one of the individuals that was well recognized for this is Dr. Jill James. Richard Deeth is another, uh, another researcher who's looked into you know, the methylation problems in, with autism recognizing that it has profound effects not only on 
language and attention and focusing, but on the cellular effects as far as the immune system, controlling inflammation, regulating oxidative stress. It's just an area that is has a tremendous amount of research that supported it, but it's also an area biochemically that's very important in the body. And this is where the whole discussion of things like methyl B12 and dimethylglycine, trimethylglycine come into play, glutathione support as well. There's this massive push that somehow we can fix everything just by fixing methylation. Unfortunately, it doesn't always play out that way. And I think there sometimes gets to be this magic bullet effect where people think that all you got to do is methyl B12 injections or all it has to be done is to give more methylfolate. And it's more complicated than that. It's not to say that those therapies aren't helpful, but really it's that puzzle piece scenario that needs to be applied biomedically to help most kids. The methylation system is critically important, but there are a lot of very important enzyme systems in the body that need to be supported as well. And they all have this interactive wheel effect. The methylation system is linked to the folate system, which is linked to the regulation of tryptophan and tyrosine and serotonin and dopamine through something called the BH4 cycle. So if all we do is just focus on MTHFR or all we do is just focus on methylation, you tend to lose the forest through the trees and in many respects don't get to where you need to go clinically because the gut and the toxins from the digestive system, the foods and the toxins from the foods can all have a negative consequence on these, the methylation and folate cycle as well. And so that's why in the courses I've taught or the approaches that I've taken, I've always talked about this four pillar approach where first off you have to get right with diet as best as possible. Try to improve the quality of food. Second to that is nutritional supplementation. Filling in those holes nutritionally that many kids are lacking. And infusing good nutrition into the body so those pathways are being supported. And then working on gut function. <clears throat> looking at yeast, looking at bacteria, looking at parasites, looking at inflammation, and working on that. And, you know, it's not always easy, but it's these things are doable. And then finally, after you've worked on those core foundations, is coming in and supporting more specifically the methylation cycle. Now, there are a lot of ways of analyzing and assessing methylation. This is a panel here that's looking at what are called polymorphisms. And this is an emerging field. There's a lot of people doing this. And there's tremendous important information from this. Um, <clears throat> But again, it's part of the biomedical approach, not its own isolated entity. A lot of attention gets paid to the MTHFR. What's interesting is that this other enzyme, COMT, can have some relevance too, particularly when you're looking at things like the organic acids test. Remember off the organic acid test, I was showing you where dopamine becomes norepinephrine, right? So dopamine gets converted to norepinephrine by what's called dopamine beta hydroxylase. And that dopamine beta hydroxylase can be inhibited because of certain toxins that get produced by Clostridia bacteria. Well, one of the other things, and by the way, if that's happening, you can get an increase in dopamine. Well, if you have a mutation in the COMT, that could also be another reason where dopamine levels become too elevated. <clears throat> COMT is also responsible for helping to break down uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. So we need that breakdown with, um, to move epinephrine and norepinephrine out of the way so that we don't get too much stimulation within the nervous system too much adrenaline and too much norepinephrine sitting around can increase that sympathetic fight or flight response and lead to things like anxiety, like hyperactivity and hyperexcitability. And of course the picture will always get more complicated when you throw clostridia in the mix. If you've got a COMT mutation that's 
blocking the ability to take dopamine away and convert it to homophenylic acid, and at the same time you're blocking the dopamine beta hydroxylase, you've got an even greater effect on the accumulation of dopamine. So the organic acid test to me has always been a core test. What's exciting as we move forward with the genetic testing and the polymorphism testing is starting to look at some of these other types of enzymes and how they can play out when we have these other competing forces going on. So what is, what's the genetics doing when it's in the presence of clostridia? What's it doing or what's the potential for when it's in the presence of high candida or high oxalates? And then, of course, Great Plains new test, the SNP1000, which is even a much greater expanded polymorphism panel that goes into so many more things other than just methylation, looking at oxalate problems, looking at cholesterol metabolism, etc. Cholesterol deficiency is something that I have been working with for quite some time and actually is very common. That's why it's in this lecture. It's a very common problem. And we know we need adequate cholesterol in order to absorb fats. Okay, it helps with vitamin absorption. We know that we need cholesterol to produce steroid hormones, cortisol, and testosterone, estrogen. And we know that the, through the formation of cholesterol, we actually create compounds for vitamin D as well. Turns out that a lot of kids on the spectrum are quite deficient in cholesterol. I typically see kids with cholesterol levels between about 110 to 120. The lowest I've seen in my practice was around 63 or 65. Very, very low. The lower the levels of cholesterol are generally associated with the increased problems in alertness, increased problems in behaviors, decreased uh, sociability or connectivity issues, much more compromised behavioral problems. That's not to say that that happens in all cases, that, but that tends to be a general trend, and it often seems to be something overlooked even by many practitioners who are, who are doing biomedical intervention. A lot of the research stems from this genetic disorder called SLOS, which these, many of these kids have very, very low levels of cholesterol, but they have many of the same autistic characteristics. And they are improved when cholesterol is implemented. So what we like to see is cholesterol levels above 160, you know, roughly. These are just a few samples of, that I've had from my practice, 116, okay? Cholesterol of 107 as they start to drop. We see a cholesterol here of 97. I actually don't have the sample of that one I had at 60. It was either 63 or 65. I can't find it. Uh, it was from a number of years ago. But 97 is pretty low. And as you'd expect, as the cholesterol levels go down, so does the severity scale, where the severity scale is fall as far as the autistic characteristics go up. So the lower cholesterol, worsening problems. From a therapy standpoint, New Beginnings has this product called New Be uh, excuse me, Sonic Cholesterol, which is actually pure cholesterol, 250 milligrams per capsule. And it's safe for people to take with an egg allergy. So it's a highly purified cholesterol and is you know, overall very effective at helping to support low cholesterol levels. Usually, if we've got a cholesterol, let's say, for example, around 120, maybe 130, you know, I would tend to use about four capsules a day as support. In some cases, we need to go higher. In some cases, I've gone to six to eight, and I've even gone to 10 capsules in some kids. Ideally, look, trying to look at blood testing every couple months if you can. The levels in the blood don't seem to come up that fast, which you oftentimes see with cholesterol intervention is just improvement in behavior, improvement in sociability, just uh, overall, I should say overall cognitive improvements versus the numbers on the labs changing quickly. That doesn't seem to happen that often. A 
Vitamin D is another area that has gained a lot of research and is fairly common in deficiency states in the autistic kids. They figure on average about 70% of children in the United States are not getting enough vitamin D. About 60% are suboptimal, but 9% are considered deficient. Now the range is quite broad, broad, usually between 40 to 80 nanograms per ml. Now some of the labs will, will look at cluster, excuse me, vitamin D levels less than 30 as being a problem. Ideally, we're looking for levels above 50. Some of this research comes from the Vitamin D Council, where they've done a lot of research into the need for vitamin D. So getting above 50 seems to be a good, um, a good area to sort of reach for, at least from what, what I've done in my practice. A lot of conditions out there can be associated with low vitamin D, or at least I should say can be improved or supported in a beneficial way we're trying to optimize vitamin D. Now what's interesting from an autism standpoint, vitamin D regulates and has an influence on serotonin. And it turns out there's two different types of enzymes that help to support serotonin metabolism. There's something called tryptophan hydroxylase 1 and tryptophan hydroxylase 2. Let me go through this for you real quickly. So vitamin D regulates a gene that's responsible for the conversion of tryptophan to serotonin. Tryptophan hydroxylase 1 is the, is the converting enzyme from tryptophan to serotonin that's most active in the gut. Tryptophan hydroxylase 2 is the tryptophan to serotonin converting enzyme that's most active in the brain. It turns out that the serotonin produced in the gut does not cross the blood-brain barrier and support serotonin produced in the brain, at least to any significant degree from uh, the research that, that I've come across. Serotonin produced in the gut, about 90% of serotonin is actually produced in the gut. It can have an effect at improving platelet um, aggregation to help with blood clotting. <clears throat> serotonin also in an excess state in the gut can be a trigger problematically for increased inflammation. It turns out that the vitamin D that regulates the gene for tryptophan hydroxylase 1 and 2, what it does in the gut is it helps to decrease tryptophan hydroxylase activity so that we're getting less proportionally serotonin produced in the gut, and at the same time, it increases the activity of tryptophan hydroxylase 2 in the digestive system, excuse me, in the brain. So tryptophan hydroxylase 2 is active in the brain. So, what, so basically what it's getting at, in the, in the face of adequate vitamin D, the gene that regulates tryptophan hydroxylase activity lowers serotonin production of the gut and increases serotonin production in the brain. <clears throat> so a little bit confusing, but it's a fascinating system that's regulated based on one specific nutrient. Lithium is something that, even though it doesn't get a lot of press, in conventional medicine, certainly gets a lot of press in the world of mental health, particularly lithium carbonate as a medication, but from an integrated standpoint for mental health challenges, nutritional lithium is extremely important. It has a stimulatory effect on brain stem cells. It helps to regulate against glutamate toxicity. It helps to restore function to damage brain cells themselves that either have been damaged directly from injury or inflammation. And what's showing up is that many of the kids on the spectrum, not all, but many, tend to have lower than optimal levels of lithium that often can show up on hair testing. In fact, in this particular paper, they were looking at mothers of young children with autism who also had low lithium levels. Low lithium levels, from what I've seen, are generally associated with those kids 
that tend to have high levels of anxiety, sometimes obsessive compulsive disorders, aggressive, irritable tendencies, easily agitated, hyper excitable. That's not always 100%, but it's a pretty high proportion. So it's not uncommon to see low lithium levels with some of these kids, and therefore doing something like a hair test is a wise idea to do because you can pick it up and it's relatively easy to get. It's not a blood test um, and many of the kids actually respond well over time with just nutritional lithium supplementation. Whether it's the lithium chloride product that New Beginnings carries, you know, five drops a day for example for you know 60 to 90 days and retest or the lithium orotate as a capsule that can be taken for you know the same amount of time. What I do typically when I do a hair test is I'll repeat the hair test minimally in 90 days, ideally, to try to repeat the level uh, to see if we're getting improvements in lithium. There's some indication research that shows that that lithium levels can actually help with the optimization of B12 vitamin at the cellular level as well. So there could be a number of different mineral imbalances that come up, but I wanted to highlight the importance of lithium, something to think about that can oftentimes be assessed by just doing a hair analysis. And then finally, just a few things, comments on heavy metals. The, he the discussion of heavy metals has been around for a long, long time. We know that they're a problem. We know that mercury is an issue and lead and arsenic are certainly our, our, our problems. I think kids in the U.S., at least, not entirely, but through the vaccine system, are getting less of exposure, although aluminum still exists and certainly thimerosal can still, still exist in some vaccines. They're not getting the level that they used to. But environmentally, that's not, that could be a different story. And depending on where kids are coming from is an entirely different story. I do a lot of contract work with groups out of China. and almost every hair analysis I see from a child out of China has extremely high levels of lead as well as arsenic and oftentimes mercury. <clears throat> Kids out of the Middle East almost all have high lead. So one of the things to get in the habit of is, is looking more into the aspect of heavy metals and I actually have an entire heavy metal talk that is available as a webinar through Great Plains webinar service. One of the things that is often advocated for is low-dose DMSA. DMSA is a specific chelator of lead. It also gets mercury and other heavy metals too. And, you know, can be a beneficial thing overall. It's not something that commonly is done in very high doses anymore. Usually just doing low-dose DMSA can be quite effective, but it's something you have to be patient with. It's not something that just works in a couple weeks and then you, then you quit. It's something that's stretched out over many, many months. So it's a, it's a long-term type of approach as opposed to sort of a quick hit that you sometimes will try and do with things like antifungal therapy or certain supplement therapy. But it's a problem, and we certainly know that mercury is also an issue. There's a lot of correlation with regards to prevalence of autism linked to mercury toxicity. Thankfully, they've removed a lot of the thimerosal from the vaccines. Not entirely. It's not a perfect uh, scenario, but they're not getting as much, at least through that route anymore. And then we also have to think about parents themselves. So. If it, for parents such as yourself, depending on your intake, your exposure, heavy metals may be part of what you're dealing with as well. And this is, just happens to be a mother of a child with autism with very high mercury levels. And then finally, pesticide exposure. This is an emerging area. I'll be talking more about this in future webinars. Pesticides are a big problem. I think we're starting to realize now being able to test for them more specifically about how many people are being exposed and the, the real negative consequences that different chemical exposures can have, particularly these organophosphate compounds in pesticides and how they can affect the detox pathways in the body that greatly then compromise the methylation cycle. So if you want to get into the whole methylation discussion, 
Well, these environmental toxins can play a significant role. What I've started doing in my practice more and more is running the GPL tox test. This is a urine test, oftentimes can be added on when an organic acid test is being ordered. And it looks at a number of different compounds that come from the environment. So gasoline derivatives, plastics, styrene, ethyl benzene. Everybody I've tested so far has come back high with MTBE linked to gasoline as well as styrene linked to plastic um, can also be found in car exhaust fumes. What's interesting though is that not in everybody but in some kids you'll also find other chemicals. Vinyl chloride which um, comes from PVC exposure and then organophosphates. Okay, In this particular child their organophosphate levels were quite high so there's clearly some type of environmental exposure occurring. So where's a place to start? Okay, To think about things medically, the common things, there's certainly things I left off the list, but let's talk about common things. Where I'll often start, again, is in the beginning is the organic acids test. It's a go-to test for me, it's a foundational test because it looks at oxalates, looks at yeast, looks at clostridia, looks at mitochondria, looks at nutrient markers. It's a good overall, all-around effective test to really get the ball rolling biomedically. The next phase for me would be looking at food sensitivity and, and food markers. Okay, Is a child reactive, immune reactive to certain foods? If they're not on a gluten casein-free diet, is that something worth pursuing? And that's where the food IgG or the urinary peptides come into play. I always like getting a hair analysis not only to check for heavy metals but for things like lithium deficiency which can be picked up that way and it's a simple test to get. If possible I'll add on the comprehensive digestive stool test to get a, a little bit deeper assessment of that microbiome. These five tests really for me are, are round out my initial uh, laboratory approach. Notice there's no test on this on this slide that requires a blood draw. We have to get a finger prick test for the food IgG, but it doesn't require a blood draw. These tests are available from Lab Test Plus. LabTestPlus.com is a website that we have where people can order these lab tests, lab tests and then have them reviewed with a written review that will come to you based on the lab results, action steps, suggestions, etc. So labtestplus.com has a whole menu of different labs that we offer. There are other labs that can be used worthwhile too. Okay, and this is where you start getting into blood draws. We don't offer any blood draw testing through Lab Test Plus. This has to be done through a doctor's prescription. Okay, but looking at you know blood chemistry, looking at anemia, looking at total cholesterol, looking at vitamin D levels. Now, the one thing I do say here about the vitamin D, Great Plains does carry a vitamin D finger prick test, and that is something we carry from Lab Test Plus. So. Um, that is another option if you want to look at vitamin D levels. You can get that through a finger prick as well. And then there are other specialized tests. Okay, These don't all have to be done and certainly don't all have to be done in the beginning. Okay, They can be very come down to very specific needs for a specific child. And this requires obviously a much more insight and lecture material because you can go into each one of these things uh, quite in depth. But again, the point of this lecture was really common factors and common things. If you have any additional questions, I'm always available through the autismactionplan.com website. This is a subscription website where you can join. There's a forum. There's a section for private messaging as well for ongoing dialogue. This past year, we actually did a course for new parents 
to biomedical intervention or parents or caregivers who are looking for a refresher on some of the core concepts, core concepts of biomedical intervention at Autism Recovery 101. This is actually available. Every presentation was recorded and they're all available for purchase um, for review. And I go through things in, in you know, fairly good detail with regards to the four pillar approach that I've talked about before. Dietary intervention, gut assessment, Clostridia candida, you know, organic acid testing, methylation problems. If you are a practitioner or if you are a parent who's wanting to get more into clinical based information, then we have something called the Autism Mastery Course. Uh, we launched an academy last year called Integrated Medicine Academy. The Autism Mastery Course was initially a 12 module course, it's now 16 modules. I'm currently about a third of the way into the current course. People can join if they want because all of the all of the lectures are recorded and then held for viewing for people who can't attend the live event. But this is a very in-depth course. It's very clinical based, um, really designed for doctors, but anyone is welcome to, to join the course and gain access to the information. And then we have other courses as well. We have a GI mastery course and then an adrenal mastery course, which is really focused towards GI and adrenal issues, obviously for healthcare practitioners. I'm always available for consultation as well. There's uh, my phone number. Best email to reach our practice is scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. In-person phone, internet consults are available. So with that, I appreciate everybody's attention tonight. I'll be back again in next month for another installment of these complimentary webinars from Great Plains. Again, if you post any questions, they'll come to me through Great Plains, or you can always, again, reach me through the autismactionplan.com site as well. Thanks so much.